Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm your host, Tom Powers. We're now in season two, and throughout September, we'll focus on films making premieres at the Toronto International Film Festival, known as TIFF, that starts on September 8th. On this episode, I talk to the directors behind two TIFF documentaries set in the jazz world. I called him Morgan, about trumpet player Lee Morgan, and Chasing Train, about saxophonist John Coltrane. We're listening now to Lee Morgan's composition, Search for the New Land, released in 1966. He was signed to the Blue Note label when he was only 18 in the 1950s. He was known for a style of hard bop influenced by rhythm and blues, and he had a crossover hit with the song Sidewinder. But in 1972, at the age of 33, he was shot to death by his common-law wife, Helen. I Called Him Morgan tells the stories of both Lee and Helen. The Swedish director, Kasper Collin, previously made the film My Name is Albert Eiler, about a saxophonist working in the style of free jazz. I reached Casper by Skype at his home in Sweden and asked what drew him to the music of Lee Morgan. It was actually seven years ago when I uh, I looked at at, uh, YouTube and I found this clip uh, with Lee Morgan performing with Art Blake and the Jazz Messengers. And they were playing in Japan in 1961 and it was a film performance and they were performing Bobby Timmons' Death Dare, uh, which is a classic composition. And... To hear and see Lee perform there, that I was so moved by him playing there. so intrigued by this guy who, who played this fantastic solo and I played this kind of on repeat over and over this clip and I just thought wow I, I need to see if there is a film here somewhere and then I started to, to, to you know do research on this project. You knew Lee Morgan from this clip did you really know anything about his backstory? Yes I mean as, as being in a uh, very interested in jazz for many years. I know about Lee Morgan and the Blue Note catalog, and I know that he was one of the most recorded artists there. Uh, and But I had not listened to him too much. But of course, I also know about the tragic ending of his life and that he was shot and that he apparently was shot by a woman that people thought was his girlfriend or something. It was very unclear. And this is what you could read also on like Wikipedia and stuff or in books. No one really know what happened in the end there. So... When, when I started to do my, my, my little research for this film, I, I always go out and, you know, try to meet up with people who, who were close to, to Lee, for instance, th- this time, Lee, of course. And it was very interesting because many of them started to talk about uh, his last years, last four years before he was shot. And they talked also about the woman he was living with, with which was Helen, Helen Morgan, which also is the woman that, that shot him. But they talked about her in a way that was filled with passion and love. And that made me very, very interested in this story. And, and I mean, because I only know her as this little note in jazz history as the woman that shot Lee Morgan. But I started to realize that there was something else there and that was very, very fascinating and moving story there. In the film, Casper interviews Lee Morgan's contemporaries like saxophonist Wayne Shorter and drummer Albert Heath who bring vivid recollections from over 40 years ago. I asked Casper why he thinks those events stayed imprinted on their memories. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing that struck me quite immediately when I started to meet people. Also that I said earlier that they started to talk quite immediately about Helen and and Lee's last years. I mean, of course, they talked about the music and the, the, the memories of playing with Lee and so on. But everyone around Lee and Helen they were friends of both Lee and Helen because they were kind of inseparable in a way. They were always together. So, I mean, they were as much friends of, of Helen as Lee. 
And when this very sad, tragic event occurred in, in 1972, when, when Helen shot Lee, they of course lost Lee. That was terrible. Their, their friend and, and music buddy Lee, the fantastic musician, but they also lost Helen. So, so they, they lost two friends at once. The feeling I had was that those people I met, they, they, they wanted to talk about this. Jazz history, tragically, has a number of performers whose lives ended early. And, you know, today in the 21st century, some of those careers stand out. You know, there are certain names that you could recognize. But I, th- I think that Lee Morgan's reputation in a you know, more general awareness has faded somewhat. And I wonder why you think that is. I don't think it is, has faded within the jazz community if we would put it that way, because that is something that struck me when I met the people that, that finally ended up to be in this film and, and also a lot of people that are not in this film now, that they, they, they really see Lee Morgan as someone very special. And it's kind of funny because, you know, even someone like everyone, even outside of jazz, knows about Miles Davis, of course. He's this mega, mega star. Uh, and But Miles himself, he, he I know that he thought very, very well of, of, of Lee himself. But it's a difficult question really to, to have a, a very simple answer of, I mean, he made this recording Sidewinder, which was this enormous hit, and that was released, it was recorded uh, late 1963, and I think it was released 64, or even, even if it was early 65. The first track on that LP was Sidewinder, and that tune became this enormous hit that was played even in non-jazz radio stations all over the United States, as I understand. And of course, at that time, Lee Morgan was really, really big, really a big star. But that also put a pressure on him to, to follow up that recording with, with kind of hit music. Lee Morgan, he, he, he recorded so much music over the years for Blow Note. And a lot of that music was not released directly. It was shelved. And that, that meant that his music, very often that was contemporary for the moment, then it was released a few years later. Then he himself, as an artist, has moved. <laughs> he had moved way beyond that. But the, the 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 last record was still the record that was, you know, is out there. And that record was recorded like three years ago or something. I think that this record, which is one of my favorites, which is called "Searching for the New Land," that record is is the album Lee is recording directly after Sidewinder. So if Sidewinder is like November, December '63. Uh, I think this is in February 1964, but I think it's released first in 66, 67 somewhere, which is, you know, Lee Morgan, he, he died when he was 33. So two years is a lot of time uh, at this, especially when you're recording this much. So in a way, I think that what was in, unfortunate for Lee Morgan in the 60s was that from Sidewinder and forward, he wasn't always in synch- synchronized with his time. I want to ask you about your cinematographer, Bradford Young. This is a cinematographer who has won a lot of recognition, often working on uh, films about African-American subjects, from big fiction like Selma to independent films like Mother of George and, uh, and some documentaries like Free Angela. How did you get the opportunity to, to work with Bradford Young? I was living in, in New York in 2010 and, and 2011 for six months when I started to work on this film. And I met up with Brad. He was a huge fan of, of uh, Albert Eiler and really liked my previous film. And then we kind of, you know, started to, to try and work together and uh, develop the, the visual style of this film. And uh, that was a fantastic gift to have a chance to work with this enormously talent, talented photographer that, that he is, I mean. Uh, and we also started to shoot because that is one, I think, one of the first key visual elements in this film for me in trying to find 
way to visualize it was this snowstorm that is occurring that night when 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 Lee was shot. Uh, and when I was living in New York that fall, 2010, I remember, I think it was two days after the Christmas, if it was 25th or 26th of, of December, 2010, one of the largest blizzards in the history of New York occurred. Uh, and <laughs> we were out shooting then, uh, and we were using an old Bolex camera. Uh, and that, that was quite, a remarkable event because I mean that is something very special within New York that's such a beautiful city I think but to be in the middle of a snowstorm in New York that's quite a thing <laughs> we shot that together the first I mean he helped me to set the tone in those images in the snow images and then I had help and then I shot some other parts myself later on but I, I remember that it was actually exactly one month later in the end of January, there was another big snowstorm we were out in. And I think that those two are number seven and eight in the history of New York uh, when it comes to the largest snowstorms. Uh, so, so I think that's quite a nice footage to use in the film. It's absolutely beautiful footage. And you have this very, these impressionistic shots of snowflakes falling, which in today's world of CGI, someone might even imagine you had uh, done in a, with a special effect. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> it's actually all shot with uh, 16 millimeter cameras. And uh, that was something we decided upon earlier. And we also pushed the film to stops to have a little extra grain in it. I mean, beside the fantastic interview with Helen Morgan and meeting with all those persons around Helen and Lee, which is amazing that so many of them are still alive. But it was when I found the, the still photographs for the film. I remember I was, it was when I was staying in New York then in 2010. I went out to the Blue Notes photo archive, which is held by a, a jazz producer called Michael Cuscuna. And uh, I met up with him. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, it's not going to be so big. It's just going to be a few pictures. And he handed over a few prints to me that they already had. Here you go. Here is 20 or 30 pictures of Lee Morgan. Those are great. Yeah, those are great. I looked at them. Do you have more? I asked. He said, yeah, there are some more. And, and then he, he brought me into the archive. And uh, I could just stay in the archive there. And they had, you know, like, cataloged all of the, the blow note sessions. And that is what is something that is so special. Because it was Alfred Lyon and Francis Wolff, those two German guys that started this record label. And one of them was a really, really talented photographer. That was Francis Wolff. And each and every session, he documented. And Lee Morgan was one of the most uh, well-recorded artists in the Blue Note catalog. So I found out there, uh, I was just about to stay for maybe two hours in this archive. But I stayed for one day, I remember. And, and, and then I came back for, for at least another full day. And what happened was that I found that there was, I think, 167 contact sheets from Lee Morgan sessions and the session with other musicians. So, it, I mean, that must have been like around 2,000 still pictures with Lee Morgan. So what I did was that I did Xerox copies of all of those contact sheets and I brought them with me home to Sweden. And this was really a fundament of building this film. Those contact sheets, they, they documented Lee Morgan from 1956 when he made his first record up to 1967, so all in black and white, you can see the development of this little wonder kid. You can see this guy, Lee Morgan, he was, he was such a funny guy and he makes everyone laugh. <laughs> uh, so, so much happiness in there. Uh, it's incredible, I think. Casper Collins' film, I Called Him Morgan, will make its TIFF premiere next week. We'll be back in a minute to talk about the film Chasing Train. If you're new to pure nonfiction, I invite you to listen to our library of past interviews. This spring, I interviewed Jonathan Demi. He'll also be at TIFF with the world premiere of his new concert documentary, Justin Timberlake plus the Tennessee Kids. Just last year, Jonathan was undergoing chemotherapy for esophageal cancer that he discussed in our interview. It definitely, um, it 
inevitably had a huge effect on me. First of all, you know, when you get radiated like that, you know, your energy level. I had enough energy in me to complete Ricky and the Flash, which I was just finishing up when I got the diagnosis, and had recently finished shooting um, Justin Timberlake uh, plus the Tennessee Kids, um, which hasn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was able to both work very enthusiastically, despite my limited energy, I had this beautiful movie, the Justin movie, to be working on. And it, it, it supported my recovery um, a lot, and it gave me something to think about other than my recovery. You can hear Jonathan Demme's full interview on episode six of Pure Nonfiction. Subscribe for free on iTunes or go to purenonfiction.net. Now we turn to the world of John Coltrane. The new documentary, Chasing Train, explores the life and music of jazz saxophonist John Coltrane, who died of liver cancer at age 40 in 1967. Director John Scheinfeld has made several music history documentaries, including The U.S. vs. John Lennon, and who is Harry Nilsson? I reached John in California by Skype and asked how he came to the music of John Coltrane. Well, I was first introduced to the music of Coltrane when I was doing a radio show in college. And uh, basically, I was playing rock and roll. But uh, we had vinyl, of course, in those days. And uh, I had uh, free access to the record cabinet. And I came across this album called My Favorite Things. And uh, I put it on and, and was checking it out to see if there's a, what that was all about. And that tra- track really had an impact on me. It's hard to explain uh, why at that particular time, but it did. And it made me want to hear more of Coltrane. Uh, so what, what year would this have been? This would have been in uh, the mid-70s. And uh, he, he passed away some years before. So he wasn't on, uh, he wasn't on my radar in any uh, significant way. Uh, and, and sort of stayed about the same for, for many, many years. And I think in some ways uh, it's what made me a, a good uh, selection to, to do this film because I wasn't obsessed with Coltrane. I wasn't into the minutia. I wasn't into uh, it in such a serious way that I didn't have a big, bigger picture view of, of his career and his music. And how did this project get started? A media producer named Spencer Proffer, who had met the family and had some conversations with them about the possibility of doing a a documentary. And I was working with Spencer on another project at the time. And he said, how would you feel about doing something uh, about John Coltrane? And I said, well, you know, I always liked that one song, but let me look more into his story. And the more that I looked into this man and his journey, uh, the more I said, this is a, a great story that needs to be told. So uh, Spencer had then connected me with uh, Ravi Coltrane, who is the executor of the estate and a a fine musician in his own right. And And John uh, Coltrane's son, right? John Coltrane's son. And we we had a long conversation. I laid out my vision for the film, and he said, let's do it. And uh, and we went from there. We have a very unique situation here, uh, Tom, that uh, we have the full participation of the family, uh, and that, that, of course, brings us uh, memorabilia, uh, home movies, uh, the treasure trove that uh, documentary filmmakers love. But we also have the full support of the three record labels that collectively own uh, Coltrane's catalog. And so I had no limitations in terms of the amount of music that I could use in the film. And uh, uh, as of today, there are 48 songs in the film. And having the luxury of, of being able to use that much music, we really can showcase a wide range of uh, Coltrane's uh, styles. And uh, I think that really uh, helps elevate uh, the impact of the film. So let me ask about that source material. When you went looking for footage materials, what did you find? There is not an abundance of Coltrane material out there. We cast, as, as I do with all my films, we, we cast a very wide net globally to uh, see what we can find. Um, all of the performance footage uh, comes from European concerts, TV concerts, um, and there are 
uh, four of those. Um, and uh, there is one that's quite rare that was just discovered about 10 years ago. And it, it was the uh, it was a live performance of his masterwork, A Love Supreme. Uh, he performed at a French jazz festival. And that footage was discovered, I think, in 2005, 2006. And uh, we have s- some some wonderful moments from that. Uh, but there was really not much. Uh, in the States at all. Certainly not, uh, he did no television, so we didn't have that. I will share one story with you, though. Uh, I, I love the treasure hunting aspect of, of making a documentary. And uh, I was in Hackensack, New Jersey, and uh, I was in the home of Chuck Stewart, who is a world-class photographer. He's 88 years old now. And he photographed everybody back in the day and uh, from, from uh, R&B like uh, Aretha Franklin to jazz, John Coltrane. And he photographed Coltrane more than anyone. Uh, and uh, he has a million negatives at, in this house. And uh, I didn't want just the, the 10 or 12 iconic shots of Coltrane. I wanted to see his negatives and his contact sheets uh, so we, we could include a, a lot of rare shots. And... I had this viewfinder in my eye and I'm going through these contact sheets and, and I must have said something like, oh, shit. And my line producer, Dave Harding, was sitting next to me. He says, what? And I said, look at this photograph. And he looked at it. He said, it's like Coltrane and some guy in the studio. And I said, yeah, but look at what the guy is holding in his hand. And it was a Super 8 movie camera. So what am I thinking uh, but that he shot the recording session? And while there are many, many photographs of Coltrane in the studio, there is uh, no uh, footage at all of him, uh, moving footage. So uh, Chuck remembered that the guy was a world-class bass player named Art Davis. And uh, we put our researcher on it, and, and unfortunately Art had passed away in 2007. But uh, he has a son who lives here in Los Angeles in an area called Van Nuys. And uh, we called him up, explained who we are and what we're doing. He says, oh, yeah, I got all the home movies in the garage. And, wow. Uh, and uh, he hadn't looked at him. He just got them all in a box when his dad passed. So we went out there and we spent uh, three Saturdays with him and uh, going through all the footage. And it was a lot of mom and dad, grandma and grandpa on the swing set in the backyard kind of home movies. But then we found it. It's a seven and a half minute color uh, Super 8 roll of uh, no sound, but Coltrane in the studio. And uh, so this will be the world premiere of that footage. No one has seen this footage uh, before. And uh, it's really quite uh, extraordinary. So we've talked about the process of collecting visuals. And I want to ask you about the process of, of doing interviews for the film. As you set out to construct the story, what were you thinking about who were the voices you wanted to have in the film? When I start out uh, to make a documentary, I have a vague notion of what the story is. So I have a, a very rough roadmap, uh, but I don't like to start off with an agenda and then bend everything to the agenda. Uh, I'd much rather go where where the truth takes me. And I, I can do I do my own research uh, largely, and um, I can spend weeks, months researching something, but there is always going to be some great story, some wonderful moment uh, that uh, I could not have been smart enough to know about, or no one ever told the story before. Uh, and uh, one must be open to those moments. And so, what I wanted to do uh, and how I approach most of the documentaries I make is to cast them much as one would cast a narrative film. And uh, that means having a, a range of voices, uh, people that knew Coltrane so they could speak with legitimacy and credibility about what he was like as a person and uh, what he was like on stage and what what he liked, what he didn't like, all those sorts of things. Um, then I wanted some people that, uh, artists that we know, uh, who had been inspired by him, uh, not just, oh, I liked him, but really inspired by him. And Carlos Santana and John Densmore are, are but two examples in, in, in this film. Um, 
And then also I want family members because family members really have a entirely different perspective on the artist. I'll give you just one small example. Uh, we tracked down uh, Coltrane's uh, stepdaughter from his first marriage. Antonia Andrews is her name. She had never, ever given an interview before, uh, uh, radio, TV, print, never. And uh, it took some persuading, but we finally got her to, to sit for an interview, and she is brilliant. And she starts off by telling a story which she felt was very small, but to me it spoke largely uh, of who Coltrane was as a man. And the story she tells was uh, it was a snowy night in New York City and Col uh, Coltrane was, was playing a gig uh, uptown. And this was in the early days uh, where they didn't have a lot of money. And she needed a pair of shoes. And he walked home in the snow so he didn't have to spend money on a bus, a cab, or the subway so that they could afford to buy her shoes the next day. And I just thought that speaks to him as a father, speaks to him as a man. And yes, it's just kind of a small story, but it, it's having um, many stories like that that will help bring Coltrane alive as a, a three-dimensional human being, which was one of my primary goals of this film. I want to ask you about uh, some of the interviews you did of, of people who just admire uh, Coltrane's music. And one that was uh, striking and kind of surprising to me was uh, President Bill Clinton. Yes. Uh, and that was a bit of an adventure, Tom. Um, uh, I had seen him tell a story uh, on the second to last week of David Letterman's uh, programs last year. And he, he talked about how he had picked up the saxophone at the age of 10 and through the end of high school, he had been obsessed with the saxophone. And uh, as he tells the story, uh, this is not in the film, by the way, uh, as he tells the story, um, he had more scholarship offers for his musicianship than he did for his academics. And he seriously thought about becoming a professional musician. And, and then he says, but I realized I was no John Coltrane. So I looked over at my wife, Karen, and I said, hmm, there's a story here. So I did some more research, and it turns out he's a big fan of Coltrane. Not just a fan, but he knows a lot about Coltrane. So uh, we were talking with his people for probably 10 months. Uh, to try to get him uh, to sit down for an interview. Uh, early on, uh, he said he would love to do that. And his people said the president would find much joy in this. And it was a question of uh, finding uh, the right time. And uh, as you know, one of, one of the great things we learn as, as uh, filmmakers is the value of patience. And uh, so we were patient for 10 months and uh, it was really near the time where we were close to locking picture. And I really didn't want to finish this film without him. And happily, on a Friday afternoon, I get a call from his press person who says, Tuesday, New York, 2.15. And it's like, I'm there. So hopped on a plane <laughs> and we did it. He was gracious. He was eloquent. He was knowledgeable and he was very passionate about Coltrane. And people who will see the film will see this come across and you will feel, I think, how much joy he he had in doing this. He didn't have to talk about world hunger and he didn't have to talk about his wife or Donald Trump. He could just talk about a great passion of his. And I find to have unexpected choices in a film uh, like this uh, has great value. When we did... Uh, the U.S. versus John Lennon, for example. We had Bobby Seale and, and Angela Davis. You would not expect to see them in a, a film about John Lennon, but they spoke very much to the times uh, uh, in which Lennon uh, lived and, and, and uh, became an activist in the late 60s. And I think here with uh, Bill Clinton and some of the others in our film, it's an unusual perspective on an artist that, again, what we're trying to do is bring him alive as a human being and 
to have the eloquence of the former leader of the free world uh, speaking uh, uh, about John Coltrane was really quite amazing. So, as you said, there's not a lot of uh, interviews with John Coltrane, at least recorded on audio. So you found a way to bring his voice into the film. Uh, talk about how you did that. Yes. Uh, one of the first things we did was, again, to cast a, a, a global net to see what existed out there. And uh, uh, we did not find any TV interviews that he did. We did find a handful of radio interviews that he had done over the years. Uh, but I didn't think the sound was good enough for us to use. And uh, as you say, I, I really wanted him to have a, a vibrant presence in the film beyond just the performance clips. So, uh, happily, he had done many, many print interviews uh, over his career. And uh, I took extracts from those print interviews and peppered them throughout the film uh, to illuminate what he might have been thinking or feeling at a particular time. And it really helped bring the storytelling alive uh, in, in a great way. And because... I'm a Midwest guy and am relentlessly optimistic. I, I always aim high on these things, Tom. And <laughs> uh, I wanted to have a movie star read them. And I put together a list of five actors that I thought would be great to, to, to do this. And I found a way to get to my first choice. So we uh, uh, sent him a, a secure link to watch the film. And... Uh, uh, Four days go by, and I don't hear from him, so I'm convinced he hated it, and I'm never going to hear from him again. And uh, on the fifth day, uh, my cell phone rings, and he doesn't say hi. He doesn't say it's me. He just says, it's beautiful, brother. Uh, when are you coming to Pittsburgh? And it's because he was uh, directing and starring in a movie in Pittsburgh, and it's Denzel Washington. Turns out he was a big Coltrane fan, didn't know a lot about Coltrane's life, certainly knew the music. Uh, and when he saw the cut, he just said, this is really an interesting guy. And he said, yes. So I flew to Pittsburgh and uh, he was wonderful, very professional. He prepared how he was going to do this. I've had some situations in the past where a star will come in and they've really not even looked at the material before they got in the studio. And he, he had looked at it, knew what he wanted to do, and uh, uh, it, it will be uh, evident to anybody who sees the film what a wonderful job he did. So what kind of preparation did he do? Did he, did he listen to tracks of Coltrane, or did he just try to get the voice in his own head? He had uh, – we had decided early on we didn't want to um, have him mimic Coltrane or sound like Coltrane. Rather, we wanted him to capture the spirit of, of Coltrane. So he really let the words um, dictate how he was going to deliver them with, I think, his own research um, uh, into what Coltrane was like as a person. So he had read some interviews uh, with people that knew Coltrane, and, and then he saw what was in our film. And... One of the reasons that I wanted Denzel, uh, aside from the fact he's one of the biggest movie stars in the business, is most of the characters that he plays in his films have a quiet strength about them. And from everyone I talk to, that is how they describe Coltrane, having a quiet strength. And so Denzel picked up on that, and, and that's how he chose to read, uh, to speak these words. I'm very interested in how a session like that goes. Are you taking a lot of first takes from Denzel Washington's readings? Are you guiding him? Are you letting him do his own thing? Describe what happens there. We had set up a very traditional high chair in front of a music stand with the script on the music stand and the headphones and then the microphone right in front of him uh, and then looking into the booth. And he came in and uh, it was very unstar-like. Uh, no entourage, no assistant. It was just Denzel, me, and the engineer in the studio. So it was really intimate and really relaxed. And, and uh, he's, uh, he's a very down-to-earth guy. At least uh, that's what I saw. And um, he looked at, the, at this high chair and he said, you know, I don't want to do that. He said, 
all of these words were spoken by Coltrane to an interviewer. Uh, so I would like to sit at a table so I can imagine the interviewer across the table from me. I said, I, we can do that. And we, we, we set that up for him, and that's how we did it. You know, what, what we started to do, Tom, I, I think, was we wanted to, um, s- wanted to, to treat these as if, had there really been tapes of these interviews, what would Coltrane have sounded like? So Denzel's delivery is very conversational. And as a result, uh, as we go through the film, there is an intimacy about it and a personal quality about it that is so different than traditional narration or an interview uh, sort of setup. And I think it really makes a big difference and, uh, and, uh, in terms of bringing Coltrane alive. Doubtless, there's going to be a lot of people who see this film who are coming to Coltrane uh, new. There's a whole generation of people who uh, you know, didn't even have your early experience with, uh, with the music. Uh, what are you hoping they take away from this story? Part of my goal here was not to make a jazz film, not to make a film specifically for the fans of Coltrane, uh, of which there are many. I wanted to take this remarkable artist and, and bring his story to a broad general audience. And that's what our goal was. And in fact, uh, I think the word jazz appears in the film maybe four times, five times. It's really a portrait of a, of a remarkable artist and the professional and the personal journey that he went on. And then we have the luxury of being able to have as our score, our underscore, exclusively the music of John Coltrane. So what I would love people to come away from is, you know, maybe Coltrane is a name they heard, maybe they know a Love Supreme, or maybe they've heard something on the radio and they want to know more about this guy. And I would love them to walk out of the theater and say, wow, What an interesting guy. What an inspiring, uplifting story of of a man who found himself and found his art uh, in in a most spiritual way and changed the musical landscape of the 20th century. Chasing Train, directed by John Scheinfeld, will make its TIFF premiere next week. I want to thank both Casper Collin and John Scheinfeld for talking with me. On our next episode, I focus on two TIFF world premieres about crime and justice. Director Jamie Kastner talks to me about The Skyjacker's Tale, his film about Ishmael Labit, a convicted murderer who professed his innocence and hijacked a plane in 1984, flying to Cuba, where he still lives. I also speak to director Steve James about his new film on white-collar crime. It's called Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. He follows the Sun family in New York's Chinatown as their small bank is singled out for fraud prosecution and they fight to clear their name. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. Thanks to our team, series producer, Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer, Kyle Murphy, web designer, Cross Strategy, marketing coordinator, Sarah Modo, social media handlers, Jordan Smith, Alana Schreiber, and executive producer, Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. If you like what you've heard, the best way to support us is to subscribe on iTunes. And please spread the word to your friends. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.